From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Progressives push President Biden to declare a national climate emergency as police in Indiana release more details about a good Samaritan who stopped a mass shooting. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial writer Mene Ukwebarua. Hello and welcome to you both. On Wednesday, President Biden will travel to a closed decommissioned coal power plant in Massachusetts, where they're now doing work for offshore wind. And he will talk about climate change. But there's a group of Democratic lawmakers that is urging President Biden to go further. He is exploring some sort of executive actions today, including awarding funds through the Federal Emergency Management Agency program, new guidance for the Low Income Home and Energy Assistance Program. But there's a group of Democratic lawmakers that want him to go further and declare a national emergency. They include Senators Bernie Sanders and Jeff Merkley from Oregon. As they write to President Biden, we have been waiting for a single piece of legislation and a single Senate vote to take bold action on our climate crisis. We urge you to put us on an emergency footing and aggressively use your executive powers to address the climate crisis. And here is White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre responding to that on Tuesday. This is an issue that has been, when it comes to the climate crisis, uh, a priority. Uh, And taking action is something that he said he will do if Congress won't. Uh, And he has been taking action, uh, as we have, uh, as I had just stated uh, in in my opening remarks, uh, since he's taken, uh, since he's taken office. Uh, So he's going to take, as I said, additional climate actions in that vein tomorrow. Uh, and he's going to continue. He's not going to just stop uh, with the actions of tomorrow, but I would not plan uh, an uh, a, uh, announcement this week on national climate emergency. Again, everything is on the table. Uh, it's just not going to be uh, this week on that decision. Kim, what do you make of this push, and what would a declaration of a national climate emergency allow President Biden to do that he can't do right now? So this is all coming, obviously, in the aftermath of the collapse of a Senate bill. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin said that he wasn't willing to spend all the additional money that Democrats wanted for clean energy at this moment, given the inflation problem. Progressives are furious about this. But they have also been calling for President to declare a climate emergency all the way since his spring. The House Progressive Caucus sent a letter back then. Green groups have been making the case for it. And what they essentially want him to do is the presidency allows for the chief executive to call emergencies under different statutes, and those unlock about 123 different powers. Congress can also call emergencies. There's some additional powers available when that happens. These emergencies do give the president vast power, and it's interesting that the actions he takes don't even necessarily have to be connected to the emergency that he described. So it's a pretty unfettered power. In this case, they are asking him to use it to halt American oil exports to stop current oil and gas drilling on federal lands, particularly offshore, to use the Defense Production Act to require companies to retool and make green energy products, and also to repurpose funds away from disaster relief or military construction and put them instead into green construction projects. We can go through why any of those ideas might be bad. All of them would be. I think there's some big legal questions about whether or not the president could get away with this. But those are what they're asking him to do. Well, I guess I would start with the idea that we already are having extremely high gas prices. President Biden and Democrats look like they're going to get whomped in the midterm elections based in large part on these inflation numbers and these high gas prices. And we also have a Russian invasion of Ukraine and President Putin there trying to use his energy resources to blackmail Europe. And so the idea that this is a great time to stop American energy exports and take drilling leases off the table, I find that hard to buy into. But also, Manet, I just find it remarkable that this is not even a president who is facing a hostile Congress. Remember, we have a Democratic president, we have a Democratic House, we have a Democratic Senate, though it's 50-50, the Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris is the tiebreaker there. 
And so if President Biden wanted to go up on Capitol Hill and do some bargaining and try to make some sort of marginal deal with Republicans, I don't know why he wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, just the other day we saw a pretty strong majority in the Senate pass a $50 billion computer chips bill. And so I get that it wouldn't be everything that the Democrats have in their dreams for what a climate piece of legislation would look like. But that's what governing is, is getting some narrow bills through to make marginal progress. That's the act of governing. And so it's remarkable to me, Manet, that instead of doing that, instead of even trying to do that, they are swinging for the fences. And part of that is that national emergency argument. Yeah, I think your last point is an important one and an underappreciated one in the sense that there is really a likelihood that if Democrats were coalescing around reasonable provisions for the subsidy of green energy, they would be able to unify support within their party. Obviously, Joe Manchin has signaled that he is interested in certain green energy provisions, but they also probably would be able to recruit a certain amount of Republican support. Not only did we see that bipartisan chips bill pass the Senate, which you mentioned, but we also saw the infrastructure bill last year garner a lot of bipartisan support, and that included a lot of funding for sort of material improvements, most of which I think is wasteful, but there definitely is a constituency of people who are willing to spend on these sorts of projects. The fact that they are not able to even unify their own party around the climate provisions that they're contemplating now shows you exactly how sort of radical their proposals are in terms of the scale of the funding that they want to dedicate towards green energy, but also in terms of the sheer impact it would have on the domestic energy industry. And to your earlier point about how ill-timed it is in terms of gas prices, it really is remarkable too. I mean, say what you will about the state of the climate emergency. I think you know people make a reasonable case that in the long run, the U.S. energy sector is going to have to make certain adaptations to limit carbon emissions. But that is in the same place that it's been for the past few decades. I don't think anyone is suggesting that we've had a unique acceleration of carbon emissions. In fact, we've seen the opposite. And so Congress should continue to deliberate what it wants to do to respond to the climate crisis on a regular basis. But on the other hand, we have had an incredible increase in gas prices in the short term. And so that should diminish our appetite for placing restrictions on domestic energy output. But all of the provisions that Kim just mentioned the president is considering would, at least in the medium term, restrict the ability of U.S. energy producers to pump oil and would mean that it would be that much harder for gas prices to come down in that intermediate term. Kim, to your point about the legality, I mean, I suppose you have to look at these 130-some laws case by case, but I will point to one. So the deal in 2015 that allowed exports of crude oil to continue, I guess, has an exception for national emergencies. But here's a line from a Politico story. It says stopping crude exports would require the Commerce and Energy Departments to report that oil exports have directly caused domestic supply shortages or sustained oil prices above world market levels. So there would be some hoops that the administration has to jump through. And I imagine there would probably be a lawsuit if it tried to do that. And somebody would argue that those were pretextual arguments, that there's not really a reasonable argument that oil prices in the U.S. are sustained above world market levels. It would be the administration trying to write the report in that way to get what it needs to meet its climate goals. And it reminds me, I guess, of some of the actions that the Trump administration took. So there was a debate about whether President Trump could declare that car imports were a national security threat and put tariffs off on them. There was a Commerce Department report that was drawn up to that effect, and the Trump administration eventually decided not to go that route. It took until the Biden administration came into office for that auto report to be released, which I read and I found it to be pretty pretextual. And so, Kim, I do think there are legal avenues to challenge some of this stuff. And I mean, particularly on some of the specifics on what the laws require for these emergencies to be declared. Yeah, on the specifics, the oil exports one is a good example you just cited. Here's another one that just shows the legal complexity of this on the demand, for instance, that the president stop oil and gas drilling. Now, he has all but put a moratorium on future gas leases, but the demand here is that he actually cancel 
current contracts. Okay, well, we do have this thing called contract law in the United States. My understanding is that while the president might have the ability to cancel those contracts, to abrogate them, that the federal government would nonetheless have to compensate the leaseholders. That could run to a pretty high chunk of change, which can't just materialize out of thin air. Guests would have to give permission for those appropriations. Congress, and this is the same Congress, by the way, that is being faulted here for not acting on climate change. There are also some practical aspects of this as well, too. For instance, on the calls that the president used the Defense Production Act to require existing corporations to retool and make green energy projects. Well, try telling an automaker in Detroit that they suddenly have to make solar panels. That's not something that can happen overnight. The machinery doesn't exist for it. It's not something that you can just make happen. I think the bigger point, though, here is the question of the legality of the president calling a national emergency at all which could be the limiting principle in that the president does have huge powers, but his right to call a national emergency is something that is nonetheless circumscribed by the definition of that word, emergency. The actual definition of that is something that is sudden or unforeseen or unpredictable, which certainly is not the case here. To listen to climate alarmists, this is something that's been going on since the end of the 19th century. And basically, Congress has been refusing to act on this issue in the entire time I've been reporter covering Washington. So what we're really talking about here in some ways is Democrats are asking the president to declare it an emergency that Congress won't act, which is not really an emergency. That's just a status quo. So I think that there would be really strong grounds to stop the president simply on the grounds of a, a broad declaration of an emergency. Hang tight. We'll be right back. You're listening to Potomac Watch from The Wall Street Journal. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Another notable piece of this emergency dynamic is that this climate emergency is not the only one that progressives are asking President Biden to declare. They are also asking him to declare an emergency to protect abortion access after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. And there, this uh, is a proposal would rely on powers under the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, the PREP Act, and it would shield doctors and pharmacies reportedly from liability for providing abortion pills. That's reading again from a news article on the case. And there's apparently, again, no decision internally in the administration to do this. There's some arguments that people internally want to do it. There's some arguments that it's a bad idea. There's one quote from an unnamed advisor saying that nobody is really gung-ho about it. But again, Manet, I mean, where are we here that the president's default move, it seems, in response to climate, in response to a Supreme Court decision is to declare that things have gotten out of hand, it's an emergency, and I need to take unilateral action. Well, there's a certain amount of political cynicism behind it. I think the idea is that sort of Americans have been completely inured to the effect of the president basically claiming unilateral authority to act on some of these issues. And when there's a deadlock in Congress, and frankly, when there's a midterm election coming up, I think Joe Biden is basically doing a cost-benefit analysis. He's saying, on the one hand, yes, people are going to complain that I'm stretching the definition of an emergency, but how many people are really paying attention to that? On the other hand, I have a chance to really deliver a policy victory to my sort of core progressive constituency that's going to get them excited to go to the polls in November and potentially save Democrats some seats. It's very cynical, but I think that's how the logic kind of breaks down. But I also kind of wanted to back up and just talk about sort of the definition of national emergencies um, and how they generally have been practiced. Over the past 50 or so years, there have been about 60 national emergencies in the United States. Some of those are still continuing. And if you look at the list of them, they generally are very, very narrow. Basically, what you have is presidents seeking extra authority and flexibility within areas that they already have a lot of control over. So that's things like trade. Um, Sometimes presidents have invoked national emergencies in order to block exports of what they think is sort of critical technology for national security or sanctions. Sometimes presidents have invoked national emergencies basically to place restrictions on the assets of foreign terrorists or foreign regimes and things like that. 
it's very rare and frankly, very new and startling that you now have presidents basically coming to the point where they're declaring national emergencies over these sweeping areas like immigration, like COVID policy, things that generally you would be treated as domestic concerns where Congress would have the primary authority to regulate them. And so I think people need to realize that the National Emergencies Act has a purpose, but generally it's been very limited in what it allows presidents to do. And it's been in areas that they already control. And I think Americans should be really, really worried about normalizing the pattern of presidents invoking these emergencies for more domestic political concern. And last thought on this, I mean, I wouldn't take Congress off the hook for responsibility for this dynamic either. I mean, the founders thought that each branch of government would be jealous guardians of their powers. And we see in modern party politics, it seems like the members of Congress who are on the president's team see themselves more on the president's team than on Congress's team. And Congress has real responsibility for tariff policy, for example, and it has delegated that to the president. But Kim, we've mentioned a couple times immigration. And of course, one precedent for what President Biden is doing now is the immigration emergency that was declared under President Trump. And how much do you think that's responsible for giving President Biden the idea that he can use powers in similar ways? Or do you think that's just one more data point on this longer trend that Manet describes? No, sadly, I think that it does have a huge role in this. Not necessarily on the specifics. These are two different cases, obviously. Here's the funny thing. I think you could actually argue that Trump might have been closer to actually having true executive authority to declare an emergency only because it was a bit more unexpected surge of people crossing the border. I think it was a stretch to claim that he needed to reappropriate military construction funds for a border wall, but you could more easily fit that into a definition of emergency. The fault, though, was that he did it because Congress wouldn't give him what he wanted. That's where these two issues do bear similarity. And in doing so, he set a precedent of having the Oval Office respond to congressional inaction that way. That's where I think he bears responsibility, because that's exactly what is happening here. This is not coming about because of some sort of event that nobody foreseen, like suddenly being hit with COVID as a public health emergency or a major natural disaster, a storm or a flood or an invasion by a foreign enemy that nobody realized was going to happen. And this is instead a tool that's being used because the president has been thwarted by the congressional branch and now wants to show some sort of action. That was the mold that Trump's border declaration fell into. We warned at the time in an editorial, I was just reading it again this morning, that it was going to set a very, very bad precedent that conservatives would live to regret. And here we are right now. Finally, police in Indiana have identified Elijah. Dickin as the 22-year-old hero who on Sunday night stopped a mass shooting at an Indiana mall. Uh, it was about 6 o'clock in the evening. A 20-year-old attacker left a mall bathroom and started shooting a rifle into a food court. And police are now saying that within 15 seconds, Mr. Dickin had drawn his own pistol that he was carrying under Indiana's constitutional carry law, fired 10 shots, and neutralized the attacker and tragically, there were three people in the food court who were killed and two who were wounded. But it is horrific to imagine what might have happened if Mr. Dickens hadn't been there and hadn't acted so swiftly. I'll just read a quote from the police chief. He said, many more people would have died if not for a responsible armed citizen that took action very quickly, unquote. And Manet, this is feeding into the, the national debate about these gun laws, carry laws, gun control policies both nationally in Congress and in individual states. And the gun control advocates are saying that this kind of intervention by an armed bystander is a pretty rare event. On the other hand, obviously, it seems to have stopped a much worse attack here in Indiana on Sunday. That's right. It may be a rare event, but that doesn't mean you don't thank God whenever it does happen. And in order for it to happen, you need to have laws that permit law-abiding citizens to carry weapons. I do think that it should stand as a warning for states like New York, which are fighting tooth and nail, including against the courts, in order to be as restrictive as possible. Because the fact of the matter is that criminals generally are able to find ways to get weapons. And in these situations where you have active shooters in public, you want to make sure that there are law-abiding citizens who are trained 
who are in a position to respond. And so I do think that it is one more piece of evidence for those advocating for responsible gun use to say that laws should permit people to be in that kind of position and potentially save even more lives. Kim, what's your read of this and particularly the timing? Because it was only about four months ago that Indiana's governor signed that constitutional carry law. Indiana used to require a permit for people to carry in public. The constitutional carry law came into effect on July 1st. And the shooting at the mall happened on July 17th. So only two weeks earlier, Mr. Dickin, who apparently did not have a permit, at least according to the information police have put out so far, even two weeks later, if the law had gone into effect about, he wouldn't have been able to be there with his handgun. Yeah, we don't know all the details about this man, this hero, by the way, in what circumstances he had his gun, you know, when did he obtain it, all of that sort of information. But I do think it's remarkable and so such good news that he was able to legally be in that situation. Because we've been having this national debate about what we do in response to what has clearly been a rise of these mass shootings. And they seem in some ways to be copycat events, often done by young, troubled men who we know have had issues in the past. So one solution, which obviously just went through Congress, is we're looking at some of these red flag laws. We're now going to allow for background checks to look at the juvenile histories. Events like this, which send the message to some of these teens that they're not necessarily going to go down in notoriety by engaging in these acts, which seems to be some of the drivers of why they do they see leave behind these manifestos they want to see their names in the headlines that maybe they'll get stopped before they even get started and nobody will ever remember and maybe that is a response that could in some way feed into slowing these things down as well too my last thought here is that the other thing that i hear from gun control advocates is that not everyone who carries a gun or is allowed to carry a gun in public under some of these laws is as responsible as mr dickens seems to be with them And there's an Indianapolis star story from 2018 that was floating around. And the headline is child finds handgun in sofa, fires a shot in Indiana, Ikea. And apparently somebody who was carrying sat down on the sofa, touring the Ikea and left his weapon in the couch cushions. And the kid came up and found it. But Monet, I mean, there are all sorts of things that are completely constitutional regulations, I think, under the Supreme Court's gun precedents. You know, Indiana could require a permit if it wanted to. Uh, It could require training. It could punish people who carried in public and did so irresponsibly, left their guns in a restroom or in a couch cushion in a store. It could do all those kinds of things. But it seems like what the Supreme Court is trying to aim at is some kind of balance. And in New York, we had this law that was recently struck down in this term that basically made it all but impossible for average citizens to carry a gun for self-defense in public. And we've now seen that the Supreme Court, at least a majority of it, says that's unconstitutional because the Second Amendment protects a right to keep and bear arms. And Justice Clarence Thomas had a nice line once that bear arms, he doesn't think, means carrying from the kitchen to the bedroom. It means something more than that. But New York's response to that has been to try to restrict as narrowly as possible it can this right under the Second Amendment, declaring all sorts of places as gun-free zones. And it seems to me that there's a balance that can be struck here where there's reasonable regulation and reasonable permitting if the state legislators want that. And you're still allowing people who are responsible and trained and are going to use that weapon if they need to in a situation like this to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Right. I, I think that what the Supreme Court did when it struck down the New York gun law was basically say that if citizens are afforded a right and the Second Amendment affords citizens the right to carry arms, they have to be able to exercise that right in a normal way. You can't have the state of New York saying, yes, you can purchase a gun, but you're not able to actually take it outside of your home, except if you jump through the most burdensome of requirements in order to get that right. The law needs to create a reasonable provision for people to exercise that right. And I think that that gets to the heart of the type of balance that you were recommending. I do think it's completely reasonable for states to impose sort of subsequent requirements 
on uh, gun ownership with training being one of them. Not every jurisdiction requires training, but some do. And I do believe that courts uh, would uphold the right of states to regulate that and to mandate it. And it frankly makes quite a lot of sense because there is a big downside to sort of the possibility of a lot of people carrying guns publicly without the proper training. We don't know necessarily the background yet of Elijah Dickin, but I think it's very likely that he was well trained in using that gun given how ably and how quickly he was able to respond. So the these are the sorts of practical questions that states are going to be asking. What kinds of training requirements do we have? What kind of gun safety requirements do we have? But those conversations will all be happening within the hopefully settled consensus that people do have a basic right to purchase and also to carry guns in public. Thank you, Manet and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. And we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.